Welcome to the World United. Welcome to the World United. Introduce Hian. Hian Nguyen, I have known for some time, which is a great pleasure. Hian is a medical doctor. But what I do know of Hian is that he's also come from a lineage of understanding deeply both the, let's say, Eastern philosophies of medicine and wholeness as well, uh, as well as fully embarking in the, the Western system too. So definitely the ability to bridge both. Um, also the CEO and founder of Vitalize Inc. And today's presentation is When Ancient Dreams become future realities. Welcome, Hian. Thank you, Mia, for that lovely introduction. And uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, Dan, for your deep message. Um, it resonated with me and um, excited to share a bit today. So I sent through, um, you know, ancient dreams becoming future realities. And, and given the track that we're talking about today, for me, that um, applies to healing healing technology, um, medicine, and how our world is definitely changing uh, quicker than ever. And <clears throat> so I wanted to firstly uh, go through how a lot of the ancient wisdom, which has really been with me all my life, but really since my early 20s, um, affected my practice of medicine and influenced, um, made me ask questions. So many questions that eventually after 10 years of practice, um, I ended up moving to the US to try and find um, answers that I didn't feel uh, medicine uh, could provide to me, uh, particularly uh, in the experience of healing, um, both healing yourself and helping people heal, um, and how that has become you know, a system in our world that doesn't really uh, bring true healing. So I think I'll start with um, a few things that really affected me when I was going through medical school. Um, I, alongside my medical training, um, which was all in Australia, uh, University of Melbourne, St. Vincent's, Royal Children's, and then um, a lot of New South Wales outback. Uh, I trained in surgery and critical care medicine. Um, obviously that, that was about a 15 year period of my life. During that time, I also, you know, around about 21, uh, started practicing uh, yoga and I delved very deeply into mystic Christianity. Um, and then later on, um, uh, met uh, a person who some of us know, Grandmother Parisha, who um, I've been studying the uh, Native American and Buddhist traditions with her for the last 20 years. Very grateful for that. And so, you know, it was a very interesting, my Families from Vietnam, so I've always uh, been comfortable with dealing with a lot of different cultures and realities and having to switch between them and uh, switching between being deeply spiritual and also a rigorous uh, scientist and, and physician eventually uh, was something I also had to do. I think one of the, the biggest things that affected me during my medical training um, and then subsequent practice, uh, I practiced, as I mentioned, uh, in surgery and intensive care was uh, a topic that that Dan mentioned as well, uh, which is death. And I still remember when I was an intern, um, seeing the first person uh, die in front of my eyes uh, in, in my life. And then I think over the next 10 years, I've probably been present for uh, hundreds of people, um, if not thousands, um, at, at the moment of death. And it, it ended up uh, making me ask a lot of questions about what is that because we often uh, avoid the topic and the idea of death even though it's something that could happen at any point in time uh, right now you know um, earthquake could happen you walk out on the street get hit by a car no people, we literally don't know uh, when or how we're going to die but it's always there um, and I found in my experiences um, as a doctor, being there uh, at the moment of passing, that so many people were not prepared to die. They were scared, had never thought about it, never confronted it. And just as bad, their families also um, 
you know, had never confronted, thought about, uh, gone deep into what is death? What does it mean? How do we deal with it? And, you know, this was the beginning probably of me starting to ask the question, you know, does, does our current way of healing and medicine really achieve what it's supposed to do? Because when someone is at the point of death, there's not much else you can do for them, whether they have cancer, whether they're older and, you know, passing of um, some illness, whether they're young and just had an accident. Um, there's not that much more if it's really that bad that modern medicine can do. Um, and yet I just found that there were so many things that could be done to help people, um, you know, almost impossible to save the body from dying. But I just wondered and kept asking the question, surely other things matter outside of the body. And as we sort of talked about already, modern medicine makes everything about the physical. Um, it's gotten a lot better, but um, you know, when we objectify the world and the only truth is what you can touch and think you can see, you know, you miss out on a lot of other things. And so I started, you know, I was very, very passionate about science. And I've trained, you know, in all the medical sciences, uh, statistics, epidemiology, um, you know, and, and since I moved into research and business, you know, even more other cool and wonderful scientific fields. But I found that when I was looking after patients who were close to or near death, um, there were so many things that you could do that weren't physical things that didn't have to do with the body. They had to do with so many other things um, from um, the emotional state of people to psychologically how they were dealing with the great unknown, which is death, because no one really knows um, what, what happens after, to helping relationships. It's so important. Um, their relationship to themselves and their past and their life and their history and what they, you know, uh, may have achieved or not achieved that they wanted to, their dreams um, that may or may not have been lived um, to their relationship to the family and, and their family's relationship to them. You know, I've seen families suffer, uh, get physically sick, depression, uh, psychosomatic disease, uh, inflammatory disease, as Dan mentioned as well, um, re all related to stress and grief and things like that. And so, you know, the, dealing with death and dying, um, was the beginning for me, not only of my uh, new path of inner growth, but um, in my practice of medicine made me start asking questions and uh, starting to realize that there, were, there are so many more important things uh, to healing and indeed to life than uh, simply the physical. Um, I was able at that time to delve into a lot of work around grief and, you know, just the things we go through when we have loss. And that was fascinating because, you know, try as you might, you can spend $100,000 in an ICU, get the latest drugs and, you know, uh, procedures and medical devices and whatnot. But, you know, you're not really achieving that much with someone who's about to die. Um, and, but they're scared and suffering on the inside. And so um, I started to train in different ways of communication and started to realize that communication was had its own power. And, you know, in my later research career uh, around placebo medicine, I uh, started to understand the power of ritual, the power of belief, and how probably at least a third of all drug effects to a half, uh, some studies say up to 90%, um, have to do with the mind-body effect and how your mind, um, your belief, your intention um, affects everything from your genetic expression. Uh, we did studies when I was at Harvard Medical School around um, the effects of meditation on uh, gene expression. And we found that um, meditating 15 minutes twice a day um, altered the expression of over 600 genes in your body. And it changed them from uh, genes that, you know, didn't work very well for things such as inflammation, immune response, um, DNA repair and switching that to uh, manifesting or expressing genes and proteins that 
were anti-inflammatory that uh, actually uh, fix DNA and stop cancers from developing, um, that uh, you know reduced uh, increased the ability of the body to heal. And this is something that you know um, the ancient traditions have always uh, told us. Everything is connected. We have a very multi multi-dimensional uh, existence and body and bodies, many bodies, physical body, you know, emotional body, mental body, energetic body. Um, and, you know, these teachings started to really help me as I would go through uh, a lot of these contradictions in my experience as a doctor. Um, so after about 10 years, you know, I really felt like I um, had exhausted most of the learning that one could do in, um, you know, traditional medicine and science. You know, I'd learned everything I could and still there was just this nagging feeling that um, there was so much more that we could do for people and the, the things that we could do for people didn't really lie in the world of what we get taught in medical school and in universities and whatnot. Um, the answers, the more value, we could get more value from looking at people's insides. And I don't mean, you know, intestines, I mean, their internal experience, their, you know, their psychology, their behavior, their relationships, their history, their past. Um, and so I ended up uh, moving to America. Um, it's about 10 years now um, and getting into research. Um, and so I worked at um, one of the country's top mind-body medicine and healing um, research labs. And, and um, that was when I really knew I couldn't go back to traditional medicine because the experiments we were doing, the technologies we were developing um, made sense. You know, we did research in uh, brain imaging and trying to understand what areas of the brain get active when people get sick and get stressed. And we found that uh, sickness and stress are very closely related. And really at the end of the day, you know, we're unsure which, what, which causes the other sometimes. Of course, if you're sick, you will get very stressed. But if you're stressed, you know, there are many changes that happen in your body. And stress, you know, you can follow that back to thoughts because, you know, the way our body responds to stress really is um, a built-in response that, you know, historically was to survive in the wilderness, you know, maybe a lion's chasing you around and your body responds in certain ways. In today's world, there are no lions or, you know, tigers or elephants chasing us around, but we seem to trigger the same intense survival, you know, mechanisms when we think about, oh, we're going to look bad, you know, this party tonight, or, you know, I'm not doing my job, I might get fired, or, you know, my boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, uh, doesn't love me anymore. These things, um, you know, we found drive just so much illness in today's world. And yet we don't, you know, most doctors hardly have any training in, um, you know, in managing or helping people uh, deal with their internal uh, dimensions, which is where the stress comes from. Um, eventually that developed into a, a program, heart disease reversal program, actually, that um, we uh, were able to get insurance to cover, um, basically focusing on these things that I always knew were important. Outside of, you know, the very fascinating science, nutritional science, lifestyle medicine science, um, it was very much also about helping people restructure their thinking, helping people turn on their natural ability to heal such as things such as meditation which again not only um, makes people feel calm but it activates all kinds of genes it turns off um, very you know uh, significant hormonal systems in the body that can cause damage and illness um, things like tai chi and other mind body practices we help them focus on sleep um, on relationships, very, very important. Um, I don't think, I think most people don't realize that, you know, if you have a heart attack, this come out, came out of one of our studies, um, the people who are most at risk of dying after that heart, heart attack are not people who are smoking, you know, sucking burnt ash into their lungs or, 
eating, you know, terrible foods or, you know, being extremely overweight and, you know, not exercising, the, the most uh, likely group of people to die after a heart attack, seven times more than normal, than people, uh, people they were compared to were uh, single or divorced, lonely men. Um, and they by far had the greatest risk of dying. And so um, helping these people, uh, you know, build relationship skills, um, you know, fix the relationships in their lives, give them, you know, the, the skills and abilities and experiences they needed that they never had before to fix those. Um, and we put this all together in a program and eventually we're able to prove um, across 10,000 patients that um, this program was actually saved twice as many lives as the best medical care that you could get. Um, and that really blew my mind. And it, you know, after that, I really um, found a passion to discover all of these non-traditional or new or emerging uh, ways of healing and to try and help them, you know, uh, accelerate and um, get them into the hands of the people who need them. During my research career, um, you know, we discovered, we didn't discover, but, you know, people don't realize that there's a thing in science and industry called the translational gap, which is um, the idea that, you know, something that someone invents today. So if someone invented today a pill that could cure cancer overnight, let's say breast cancer, and it's proven, it's got all the studies, everything, um, it takes on average 17 years for that thing that someone has invented that actually works and helps people. 17 years for it to be used by 50% of doctors. Um, and that really, really just made no sense to me. It was, it was just mind blowing. And so for the last 10 or so years, I've been in the technology space, um, you know, looking for medical technologies and innovations um, and, uh, we've raised a fairly large fund to support those kind of companies. And the companies that um, excite me the most are the ones that, you know, um, have now emerged and seem to be based on many of the teachings and um, understandings and predictions of ancient wisdom. Um, we've been looking recently at, um, in the field of diagnostics, um, there is now a new, you know, diagnostic in this case, imaging. Um, you might have had an x-ray one time if you broke your arm or sprained your ankle. You know, if people want to look inside, they'll do a CT scan where they shoot radiation at you and, um, you know, try to create a picture of, of what, what a person's insides looks like. Uh, MRIs, you know, using magnets to bounce waves off and make a picture. Um, there are a lot of companies now working on the idea that uh, we are actually all made of light. Um, all the cells in our body emit light called biophotons. And there are companies out there today who have um, developed ways of uh, seeing the light shining off our bodies. And uh, they're in clinical studies at Mayo Clinic and all kinds of places um, uh, validating this type of imaging where basically, um, you know, the machines, the devices they've created charge your energy field with electricity and that makes uh, the biophotons show up and there are anecdotes and there are studies but what impressed me was in one case um, they they used this biophotonic camera and they were able to detect uh, kidney cancer six months before it showed on any scan any mri any any, any ct and so we're moving now to you know an understanding of the body that goes beyond very basic, you know, understanding of radiation and bones and things like that, and moving to a more energetic perspective of understanding the body as a vibrational field that can be, you know, seen by and can be affected by, you know, light, sound, frequency. Um, and, and so that's very fascinating, exciting. Um, another area that we've been working a lot in is in um, PTSD and trauma. And so uh, there are so many companies coming out now where, you know, various types of brain imaging um, are being used to 
literally see when a person's about to go back into trauma. And so there, um, you know, recently we looked at a, a company that basically has about a 95% remission rate for PTSD. Uh, the best treatment in the uh, industry right now is probably a thing called eye movement desensitization therapy. And that's about a 30% remission rate. And so uh, these companies that are coming out now, um, you know, and, and obviously here in America, I, I think 10 veterans die an hour by suicide because of PTSD. So it's a, an endemic problem that, that has had very few successful uh, treatments to this point. But the companies now are really truly understanding that, you know, uh, people's health and bodies uh, can be deeply affected by trauma, memory of trauma, which really, how is it any different if it's going on in people's brains and their body bodies are literally re-experiencing trauma? You know, it's, uh, you know, firstly, there's an understanding that, you know, just because we can't see it out there, a person is still going through it. And so the new technologies that are coming out have ways to image the brain and understand that there's a connection between what you see in the electricity or the waves and an actual trauma or experience that people are reliving. And what they're doing is basically using that ability to uh, detect what's going on in a person's mind and experience and helping those people slowly, slowly touch those traumas to the point, just to the point where the body starts to actually respond. It starts to manifest and express in the body. And at that point, they stop. They help the person come just close enough and then stop. And it's having effects. It's actually, you know, working. It's actually having almost a nine out of 10 uh, healing rate, complete remission. And, you know, this, again, feels much more na natural and right to me as, as a doctor that, you know, now we're looking at the right things. And these are things that, you know, um, were spoken by by ancient traditions and wisdoms. And now they're being applied. And... Uh, I think probably finally, I know time's dragging on a bit here. There are many things that we could talk about, um, but um, we've been asked recently to consult on a bunch of companies building a regeneration bed uh, that basically is built on understandings of vibrational medicine and how uh, light and sound can change uh, genetic expression, biochemical pathways, um, you know, and combining that with helping people, uh, you know, restructure their ideas, thinking, letting go of things that, you know, keep them to a certain story and a reality. Um, and this is very exciting. It's, it's very futuristic, but I never thought, you know, my mentors, advisors have always told me, hey, wouldn't it be cool one day if you took all that vibrational stuff and someone made a, a, a healing bed like Star Trek? And, um, you know, what do you know, probably 18 months ago, 12 months ago, um, you know, companies, healing bed companies started coming out. So um, I know we're running out of time, but I basically wanted to uh, say that it's a fascinating time in the world. And I think, you know, last two years especially has been crazy, but it's also um, been a time where we've, I've seen just such a quantum leap in how the world is transforming and changing. And um, there are many, many other examples of how, you know, in real life, in the real practice of medicine, things that could affect the billions of people on this planet, you know, ancient wisdom, once again, you know, is informing um, practice and more importantly to me, technology, because it, it helps uh, the benefits get to, to many, many, many more people than just one person. Um, these ancient wisdoms are powering, you know, these amazing new innovations that um, I think already now are our future reality. So that is a that is a beautiful part here. 